Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to View from the Trenches and what, what are you going to do on Monday morning? I know it's been a long week and we're very excited to all have you here on a Friday evening. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and please do feel free to get food and drinks. We do want to um, have this to be a fun session and hopefully a little interactive. Um, I don't know if the technical crew can pull up our slides. But I, I did want to welcome, uh, we have a very esteemed panel uh, joining us today. Uh, so the format for the session is we wanted to highlight some of the key presentations that uh, came out this week. I know many of you just came from the year in review, so saw a lot of the great data. Um, so we'll share uh, briefly what some of the data is, but then we're going to take advantage of these very smart people up here uh, to provide us their thoughts on what to do on Monday morning uh, once, um, you know, processing these data and see what uh, they think. We'll also welcome questions from the audience um, so that we can um, see what, what you all are thinking. Uh, and so for those of you watching virtually, feel free to submit questions online as well. So this is, uh, my name is Sarah Tulaney. Uh, I'll be moderating the panel today. I'm from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, to my left is Dr. Bill Barlow, who uh, is part of the SWOG Breast Cancer uh, Committee and is a key statistician uh, that will help us answer some of our statistical challenges. Uh, and then uh, to his left is Dr. Joyce O'Sonnesy, coming from Texas Oncology Baylor Cancer Center. Uh, Heather MacArthur, to her left, uh, is from UT Southwestern. And then uh, next to her is Dr. Javier Cortez uh, from the International Breast Cancer Center in Spain. And uh, towards the end there, we've got Dr. Rich Zellers, uh, who will be our radiation oncology expert from Indiana University, and uh, Dr. Alistair Thompson, uh, our surgical expert from Baylor Cancer Center, and Leslie Glenn. Uh, we're really excited to have her, our patient advocate and founder of Project Life. Um, so we will have some, um, uh, we will have the opportunity to have some polling questions. So if you'd like to join into that, we'd love that. Uh, so please scan the uh, QR code or you can join slido.com and use that number to be able to answer questions as we go through. So the first area we are gonna tackle is very straightforward. Uh, what is the appropriate first line therapy for metastatic ear positive breast cancer? Uh, we've obviously all seen multiple phase three trials that have uh, been presented, and these trials have had very consistent data across all of the agents, whether it's palbociclib, ribociclib, or bemociclib, in terms of progression-free survival, where in essence we've seen very consistent, consistent hazard ratios of around 0.5. This, at this meeting, we did see data from Monarch 3 with the final overall survival analysis. This was the first line study of aromatase inhibition with or without abemocyclib. And what we saw was that there was a very large clinically meaningful improvement in overall survival with a delta between the two arms of 13 months, but this did not reach statistical significance. They also looked at overall survival in the visceral metastasis population, and here again you see about a 15-month delta between the two arms. Additionally, they presented the uh, final progression-free survival analysis, again confirming that hazard ratio of, of 0.5 from adding abema to endocrine therapy. And interestingly, when you look at the six-year landmark time point, you can actually see that 23% of patients in the abema cyclob arm remain progression-free. When looking at crossover, you can see in the control arm that about 30% of patients did go on to get subsequent CDK4-6 inhibition, and so important to keep that in mind as we interpret survival data. I thought this was helpful, and again, maybe not always correct to cross-trial compare, but we're obviously all thinking about this in our head is, you know, how did Monarch 3 compare in terms of survival relative to Mona Lisa 2? We saw that Mona Lisa 2 did show that adding ribocyclob to an aromatase inhibitor did lead to statistically significant improvement in overall survival. This was an analysis at a, around six and a half years where they had a hazard ratio of 0.76. What I think is interesting is we had previously seen the interim overall survival analysis for Monarch 3 at that same six-year time point, and you can see the numbers look pretty similar. That hazard ratio is also about 0.76, and if you look at the overall survival in the abemocyclob arm, you see it's 67 months, and you see around 64 months in the Mona Lisa 2 arm. 
But then when you move on to this final OS analysis that we just saw at this meeting, you see now the hazard ratio is 0.8 and is not statistically significant. Here is just the statistical analysis plan, and um, one thing to keep in mind is that this final overall survival analysis did occur at eight years, so you know the longest uh, survival at the final analysis time point of the other trials. But they had an interesting design where they split the alpha so that when they, they were able to look at overall survival in the ITT population, but also in the visceral metastasis population. And so I think the first question I'd like to pose to our statistical expert, Dr. Barlow, um, is what do you think of this statistical design? Do you think having split the alpha, having a two to one randomization, meaning that the control arm did have fewer patients, for example, than, than we'd seen in the control arm of Mona Lisa II, and here having a, a longer follow-up time now at eight years, do you think these things could impact overall survival statistical significance? Oh. So I actually do not think the two-to-one randomization hurt the design because they, they accommodated that in the original sample size estimate. It's a larger sample size estimate than it would have been had it been one-to-one. -one. So I don't think that's responsible. I also don't think it's the split alpha because if you notice that the 95% confidence interval includes one on this final analysis, even if you put the two pieces of alpha back together again, it's the alpha value for the final analysis was 0 0.041. So it wouldn't have been significant had, even had they not split the alphas. But I think the differences are between the two trials. Well, certainly the, the long follow-up and the different po post-progression treatments as well as deaths not maybe due to, to cancer are obscuring the difference between the arms. But probably the, the biggest difference is really in the original uh, design for the power calculations. Both of the trials were designed to find a hazard ratio of 0.67 for progression-free survival. But the difference is Mona Lisa 3, or sorry, Mona Lisa 2 was powered for 88.5% whereas uh, Monarch 3 was powered at 80%. So it didn't leave a large margin of an error for the overall survival analysis to come. So that's why the sample size overall for uh, Monarch 3 is a little bit smaller than Mona Lisa 2, even though the other one was one to one. So I think it really is just a question of enough power to find the overall survival difference. It was obviously well powered to find the progression free effect. Thank you. That's very helpful when thinking about this. Obviously, survival analyses are, are quite complicated and important to keep in mind. They're also this was a secondary endpoint of the trial. Um, so now we have all this data from all these trials, um, putting them all together. Here you can see, you know, very consistently with ribocyclob, we've seen statistical significance for OS, whether in the first line, second line setting. Um, with abemocyclib, again, we see a clinically meaningful difference in Monarch 3 in the first line setting, but not technically statistically significant. In Monarch 2, again, reached statistical significance for abemocyclib. And the Paloma 2 and 3 study with palbocyclib did not reach statistical significance for survival. So I'd like to turn to my medical oncology colleagues here, and, you know, I'm curious. Um, you know, we'd seen previously the interim analysis for overall survival for Monarch 3, and now we've seen the final analysis. Seeing that it didn't technically meet statistical significance, is this going to change your view of abemocyclib? Does it influence your choice of selection of CDK4-6 inhibition in the first-line setting? I'll pass this very easy question to Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy. <laughs> Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't change anything for me uh, in terms of uh, my practice. You know, I think the um, delta on survival is really very large—13 and a half months, I think it is, or something. And the, the study met its primary endpoint, which I think is the most important thing to us. Um, as we just heard from Dr. Barlow, you know, it was um, a smaller trial. It was event-driven. It took eight years to get those events, and the longer you go, the, lo the more time there is for crossover to get a CDK4-6 inhibitor for additional therapies to influence the natural history of the, um, of the metastatic disease and for patients to die of other things. So that's just um, getting way out there. It's 
um, you're getting further and further away from the initial intervention. So I, it doesn't um, change anything for me. I'm very happy with the Delta. So I will just continue to use abemacyclib um, as I do, which is in the first line setting, I use it generally for patients that have more virulent disease where they are the least likely to be endocrine therapy sensitive. Those are the patients I choose abemacyclib for, and um, so that, that's just been my practice pattern. How about you, Heather? I mean, it's a shame that it didn't meet statistical significance because certainly a 13-month improvement in overall survival is clinically impactful, but it doesn't fundamentally change my practice. I think similar to Joy's, I'm already using abemacyclib in the adjuvant setting after the overall survival data was presented, what is it, a year and a half ago from Mona Lisa. I had already changed my practice from first-line palbocyclib, although we're going to have some interesting conversations about other options in that setting um, later on today, but I'd already shifted to ribocyclib with AI um, as first-line metastatic um, strategy. Um, so it doesn't fundamentally change my practice, but it's disappointing that it wasn't statistically significant. Javier, do you have anything to add to that? So, no, de definitely not. Not for many reasons. The first one is that I always, always consider the primary point to make my decisions. So I didn't change in a great way when we did not observe any improvement in survival for palbocyclic. So can you imagine today? So palbocyclic, when we com complement the data with a real-world evidence experience with a very complex statistical analysis, we observed a survival there. We presented the participant log. Maybe we'll talk about that with very nice median overall survival. So I think, in my opinion, all these three agents going in the, go in the same direction for the primary endpoint. So I think, and you also mentioned the delta. The delta is identical to Mona Lisa 2. So I think it's, I don't know if it would have included maybe 100 more patients. I think that people value would have clearly statistical significance. So for me, I, this does not change anything. Oh, thank you. So you alluded to this, um, but we also saw at this meeting data from Parsifal. This trial was originally really designed to assess if it mattered what the endocrine backbone was that you were using in the first line setting with CDK4-6 inhibition. Did it matter if you chose fulvestrin as your backbone or an aromatase inhibitor? And we had previously seen data that it didn't matter. In fact, these arms performed very similarly. And now we have longer follow-up, again suggesting endocrine backbone choice did not matter. However, what's interesting to me is that the overall survival when you merge these two um, arms together, you see is about 65 months, um, which is interesting because if you remember Paloma 2, which did not reach statistical significance um, with AI uh, and palbocyclib, had a 54-month overall survival. So this is clearly much longer, and it's more in line with what we've actually seen from the Monarch 3 study as well as in Mona Lisa 2, where the survival is in this 64 to 67-month range. And so I'm curious now, um, seeing these data, you know, does it change your perspective on palbocyclib? And on Monday, when you're prescribing a drug, what are you really going to prescribe uh, to your patients? Um, maybe, Heather, I'll start with you. You had said you had switched your practice over to mostly using ribocyclib after Mona Lisa 2. Does this sway you to, to have more flexibility in your choice? Again, I don't think that this changes my practice pattern, but it does reassure me about all the historical data that we have in this space that the endocrine therapy backbone is consistently effective as a, pat as a backbone for a CDK4-6. How about you, Joyce? Yeah, I, I was very happy to see that, this, to tell you the truth. I think um, I was very puzzled by the survival data in Paloma 2. It, too, was a study that read out its final survival very, very late. There's a, you know, lots to follow up. A lot of other uh, therapies intervened. So it was always very puzzling since the PFS was ex exactly the same in all of these trials. Um, and then there's real-world evidence, as Javi said, there's real-world evidence, you know, again, with all the caveats of real-world evidence, um, showing improvement in survival with uh, palbocyclib um, AI versus AI in the first line setting of real-world evidence. But this, is, um, uh, this was an endocrine therapy-sensitive population. So this was a group of patients that um, had to be at least a year after their finishing their adjuvant um, uh, endocrine therapy. 
And so this, this on purpose was an endocrine therapy sensitive group of patients. And that's, um, that's exactly where I have always liked to use palbociclib. You know, I do use, um, as Heather said, more ribociclib because the, um, the, the totality of the survival data there is, is the most. And so I, too, have shifted my, um, my patients who I think are probably going to be endocrine therapy sensitive. I've shifted uh, most of them to ribocyclib, but there are patients for whom um, toxicity is the number one issue, you know, and, um, or they have cardiac issues or whatever. And so I've been using some palbociclib right along, and this, this gives me greater comfort to do that and to have that conversation with patients, you know, and, ha and just put it out there and give us some choices. So I do feel more comfortable based on these data. Javier, well, it's you. difficult to add anything, but I would like to highlight that this is a 400 patient cohort at the end. So 400 is even higher than any of the other CK4 and CK inhibitor arm in the phase three trials. So it's a huge number of patients. It's a, I would say, single cohort. We were not randomized against no CDK, but the data are very reassuring. I think that this complements very well the evidence we have with CDK pharmacy inhibitors. Medium overall survival are similarly, or very similar in, in, in the three trials, three trials, Monarch 3, Monalisa 2, and long Parsifal, which is not similar. But for me, again, we are in the same direction. I feel comfortable with any of these drugs. What I'm not comfortable is if I, if I do not use at least any of the, one of them. So that's my, my biggest message here. Oh, that's very helpful. Well, we're very fortunate to have Leslie joining us. And I think one of the questions I always have when discussing all this very complicated data in clinic is, do patients really want to hear about all the choices that there are and why maybe we're picking one over the other? Or is that just going to overwhelm people? And you know, when, if you were picking a, an agent here, how would you think about you know, choice here? Um, you know, does toxicity play a, a major role in the decision? Um, or, or how would you think the best way for us as physicians is to explain this data to our patients? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah um, I think that that is a real relative question, right? Because you have someone like me that has been living with metastatic disease for over 11 years now. And so the way that I make decisions is going to be very different from someone that's going to go on to their first line of treatment. So it really depends on the patient um, and how they want to hear it. Some patients may not want to know all of the data, or you may have a patient that's hungry and wants to know everything, and you need to show up with everything to show them. Um, what is, you know, one of my other patient advocate friends shared earlier on a panel, you know, what is their learning style? Um, I always make sure that my oncologist, and my oncologist knows that she better bring every, you know, piece of paper with research. She needs to bring data, because I'm probably going to bring the same thing. Um, and I want to read everything before I have to make a decision. I also think it's important that you give your patient options. Um, Maybe they don't want one, and they might actually tell you, what do you want me to do? And in that case, then you know you can offer your suggestion. But I feel ultimately it needs to be the patient's decision um, of what they can live with. I mean, because no matter what, these are toxicities that are being put into our bodies, and we don't know how they're going to um, you know, go through work through our systems. We don't know exactly um, what the adverse effects are, what may be tolerable for one person is not tolerable for the next. So in these research, we're only guessing what is tolerable. You don't know until you get it out into the greater um, population. So I think being honest with the patients and saying, you know, this could be, you could have bouts of diarrhea, nausea, um, but let's get you ahead of the ball game. Let's not wait until you're three months down the road with one of these medications, treatments. Um, you know, we want to be able to help you along the way, whether it's one week, two weeks. Can we follow up? Let's see how you're doing. Because you definitely don't want someone to come back and just say, I just can't do this anymore. Oh, that's so important and so critical that we can have shared decision-making in this process. So oh, thank you for sharing that.
Um, well, we're going to see if this works. So we're going to throw a poll out at you all. Um, so when you go back to clinic on Monday, and you have a patient sitting before you who has metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and you're going to start first line therapy, which CDK4-6 inhibitor are you going to choose? It's interesting to see these bars yeah, kind of yeah. wiggling. <laughs> okay, well, it seems like the general trend is that, you know, the majority of people are, are selecting ribocyclob uh, with a second uh, choice being a bemocyclob and, and pelvo lower down. Um, so, you know, just to complicate things even more, <laughs> Um, when we're going to pick therapy in the first line setting, we saw some really um, exciting data uh, earlier this morning, actually, that was specific for patients who recur on or within 12 months of adjuvant endocrine therapy and also have a PI3 kinase mutation. And so in this setting, patients were randomized to get fulvestrant with palbociclib with or without enavolisib, so that's an oral PI3 kinase inhibitor. And what we saw was a very large difference in progression-free survival. So the control arm of fulvestrant palbociclib had a PFS a little over seven months compared to the triplet having a PFS of 15 months with a hazard ratio of 0.43 that, that did meet statistical significance. Overall survival data is still immature, but you do see a pretty nice trend uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.64 favoring the triplet combination. Very interestingly, you see more than a doubling of objective response rate with the triplet compared to the doublet. Obviously, we also have to factor in toxicities with adding a, another agent to the treatment regimen. And what you can see is that there is stomatitis, hyperglycemia, and diarrhea occurring in around 50% of patients and rash in about a quarter of patients. But the, I think the good thing is that there's very low high-grade toxicity, that most of all these side effects are low-grade, but they still are added toxicities. In the setting of the toxicity, we saw discontinuation rate in the triplet arm of about 7%, so I think certainly much lower than we've previously seen with other uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. So now, uh, on Monday morning, um, you know, we've seen this data, and let's pretend we got a very rapid approval and uh, this triplet regimen was actually available on Monday. Would you utilize it? and in whom. And I think as you think about this, one thing it'd be nice to share with the audience too is, do you actually have genomic testing in all your first line patients to actually know which patients have a mutation uh, to make this decision up front? So maybe we'll start in the reverse order. We'll start with Javier now. <laughs> so no, no, today I think that we do not use genomic testing at first line because this will not change the treatment of our patients. But after this data, once it's approved, because this is going to be approved, so we will have to change maybe the decision. Now, I always, or we always lose the opportunity to explore the sequencing in this type of trial. So the point is, of course, we will have an improvement in survival, probably, but what would happen if all patients after progressive disease would have the opportunity to receive a P3CI inhibitor pathway, or a P3CI pathway inhibitor? I don't know if this might change anything. Regarding toxicity profile, we should not forget that Serious adverse events were 15% higher here and three times more deaths. The number was very small, 1.2 compared with 6%, with 3%, sorry, 3.6%, 3.8%, but three times higher. And finally, CDK4 and Cisco for me, he is the partner, so I don't care if it is Palvo, Ribo, or Abema. So as a conclusion, this is a very good strategy, but I always miss the question about sequencing that in some way, we should try to address also this aspect in, in clinical trials at some time. Oh, thank you. How about you, Heather? Well, I mean, it's pretty provocative. So um, a super high-risk population, right? Again, progression during or within 12 months of adjuvant endocrine therapy completion with a hazard ratio for PFS of 0 0.43, which we haven't seen a hazard ratio like that with any other study. 
Um, and that trend toward the survival advantage is certainly very compelling. So you might think that in a lower risk population, there might, I, I mean, it's hard to show that magnitude of benefit in a super high risk population like that. Um, so I would be tempted, I, I'm still honestly distilling this data because I moved from doing upfront genomics on the diagnostic biopsy at the time of metastatic um, diagnosis, I pivoted to um, liquid biopsy testing at first progression once the ESR1 LSSRINT data became available. And now I have to rethink my whole genomic testing algorithm based on this data when it um, becomes approved. So I think the standard of care is still the AI CDK first line therapy, but this is potentially paradigm shifting going forward, especially if that survival advantage proves to be legitimate after uh, further follow-up. Oh, thank you. And uh, Joyce? Yeah, I, I think these data are practice uh, changing. Hopefully they'll be approved in, you know, on NCCN guidelines quickly so we can um, offer it. Um, I would definitely use it in the patients um, that were eligible for the trial. They were very high risk. They were, um, they recurred on adjuvant endocrine therapy or within a year of finishing adjuvant endocrine therapy. They had a PIK3CA mutation mostly found on CT DNA, and so that means they were shedders, um, which we know is more highly proliferative, uh, more aggressive cancer, um, and they had to have measurable disease. So it was enriched for visceral metastasis. And the medium PFS with you know, a very good regimen of fulvestrant and palbocyclib um, was only 7.3 months, which is, of course, very much less than we hope to achieve with a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy. So I think this, um, this activated PI3 kinase is, is really very, very um, operational here. So I would definitely um, use it. I guess the question I would have is if I had someone slightly further out from their um, adjuvant therapy, not just, you know, within a year, a little further out, and it's coming in with a very, very aggressive recurrence, you know, because um, I, I think I'm going to have to shift to uh, getting the ctDNA up front. Now, would I enlarge the eligibility a little bit in the, in the context of a very aggressive situation with a pic 3 ca and I, and I might, you know, I might. This is, you know, I was, I was impressed. It was a, and I, I, I don't remember his name, but it was a, one of the scientists we heard here this week, fabulous. You know, they were all fabulous. And, he, and we were talking about dosing and everything. And he said, you, you got you to hit these targets hard. You got to get in there. You got to hit them hard. You got to hit them fast. And, you know, the thing about this triplet is it's all, um, you know, the estrogen receptor and the CDK and the pi kinase they're all in the same pathway. And it's, we're just, you know, tripled down on this pathway. And that's why I think we see this very um, important data. So I personally think the triplet is likely to be better than doing um, endocrine therapy, CDK, and then doing an avalisib endocrine therapy second line, doing it sequentially. I think it's likely that the triplet is going to be special. Um, you know, I, as I looked at the toxicity profile, of, no, I don't mind at all that it's on um, palbocyclib. Not at all. I think the, I'm reassured, as we said. Um, with regard to toxicity, as I was watching the toxicity data come up, I thought, Gee, I, we know how to handle those. You know, I think I think the biggest thing is is that the hemoglobin A1C was six or under, and we're going to have to liberalize that a little bit and start some prophylactic metformin, um, like we in the Metallica trial with alpelisib, et cetera. So that's going to probably be the biggest biggest challenge is how do we liberalize it? The, you know, the, the hyperglycemia data here are not bad at all. You know, but it was a it was a very uh, they were. Uh, group of patients at low risk for hyperglycemia. So I think that's the only um, uh, challenge that I could foresee. Thanks, so, Joyce. I would like to make a comment here. So we are working in the chemo space in doing sequential strategies with monotherapy. And it seems now that in the endocrine therapy field, where we feel more comfortable because of toxicity, is more friendly for patients, we are trying to put everything together at the very beginning. It's true that the, 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 the strategy is very active. I'm not complaining. So this is the best strategy we have seen probably in the first line setting. However, I think that if we do not explore sequencing in, a, in an appropriate way, I think that we are going against what we have done with the chemotherapy strategies. Don't you think that for some patients, of course, very aggressive disease, many liver metastases, that's fine. But for the great majority of them, we could have the opportunity to explore CDK plus endocrine therapy followed by full or whatever the partner is 
plus in a policy, don't you think that this is a better strategy, knowing that sequencing in the chemotherapeutic strategy is what we are doing? It seems that we are going back and trying to do everything together at the very beginning. You know, I think you, take, you make a good point. It would be nice to have a randomized trial of the triplet versus a doublet followed by a doublet. You know, right. uh, a, right. kind of a, a Sonia-esque like uh, design, but I want to see it versus the triplet. I really but would like to see maybe, that hypothesis. Maybe the optimal doublet here is in abolition first and the CDK afterwards. I don't know. But a three arm, yeah, yeah. But as long, I, I think it's a very important question because it would reduce toxicity. Um, but um, I just don't like this medium PFS I'm seeing here. And I think we all know that these pic 3 ca mutant breast cancers in the metastatic setting are very difficult to get durable benefit for patients. So, um, so I, you know, I, the idea, of the possibility of getting, um, this is more than double, as Heather said, 0.43, but I think, it's, I think it's very likely a question worth addressing. But do you think it's even feasible with all the CERDs, the CRN, all the novel agents that are moving into this space? <laughs> Can we even do a trial like that? I don't, I, it's the right thing to do intellectually, but is it going to be feasible? I don't think so. Well, you walked into this one, Heather, because one of the I'm questions sorry. <laughs> from, uh, from the audience is really addressing this question of what sequence are we really doing now, and what about all these other options like Everlimus, for example, where does Everlimus live uh, currently and, and surds? And so I don't know if you want to address how you're, you're using these agents right now. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's difficult because there's no clear algorithm, I don't think, and we're struggling with, you know, the maintained data, small study, but supports CDK sequencing potentially by changing the endocrine therapy backbone. Um, we have now um, Alicestrant for those who acquire ESR1 mutations after um, first-line therapy typically. Um, and now pic 3 ca options, um, Alpalisib, I have to be honest, I don't use a ton of Alpalisib um, because I found the toxicity a little bit diff difficult to manage. But it sort of depends on the patient, the pace of disease, the distribution of disease, the volume of disease for me. They're very individualized treatment decisions now in my mind. Yeah, that's quite complicated. Obviously, we also just recently got the approval with Kepivacertib. Uh, we have Everlimus, we have the CERD. Some people are recycling CDK46 beyond progression, right? It's a very complex space. Uh, Leslie, uh, now to bring your perspective into this, you saw some of those toxicities that were added by adding a third agent, such as a hyperglycemia, stomatitis, and rash. And how do you think about that when uh, being faced with a potential uh, triplet combination? Do you think it's worth it? Yeah, I thought I was just looking over the toxicities again, the slide, and I'm just like, this really sucks, honestly. Um, <laughs> You know, I would, as a patient, I would say, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I often wonder why they pick Palbo in a lot of these. Um, what would Ribo do? You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I looked at how many people dropped out, and then, which, you know, is a, is a small number, but look at the number of people that needed dose reductions. Um, that's quite a big percentage of people that needed dose reductions. And so I think that goes to, you know, to say that the toxicity is pretty dang bad. So. Well, I think one challenge certainly in this trial is that there wasn't prophylaxis mandated. And I will say I feel like we have learned a bit about management, and so hopefully we can do better. Uh, and I know there is a planned study to try to address uh, decreasing toxicity. Um, you know, for example, could we use antihistamines to prevent rash? Uh, Joyce mentioned, can you use metformin maybe in someone with a higher hemoglobin A1C to prevent hyperglycemia? So hopefully we can mitigate these. And I think that the good part, at least these weren't high grade. And so I, I think, you know, it's very important, as, as Leslie noted, to sort of balance this and to have an open conversation with patients about the, the potential side effects so that you know, they can be involved in a shared decision-making process about this. Um, so before we move on, I'll, we're happy to take any questions from the audience in here as well. There are uh, three mics throughout the room, and so feel free to, to come up to the mics, and we're, we're happy to, to take any questions as we, we go on. 
So I'll take that, the microphone to the far right. Sorry, this one? Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm, my name's Heather West. I'm a medical oncologist at the county hospital at Denver Health. And I'm struck by a feeling of a little bit of despair with my patient population that I treat because all of these promising things require genomic testing and free CT DNA testing, and I feel like um, there is going to be an even wider gap in disparities because of availability of this testing in my population. So I'm just wondering if uh, the panel could comment on that a little bit. Uh, do one of you want to take that challenging question? Yeah, I, I, I think um, it's a really important question, and it's one the, as the uh, regimens become more complicated, it becomes more challenging for people that need to come back every week or two in the beginning for close monitoring. That's not always possible, of course, with the transportation. It's just people live too far. They just can't do it. And that's, that's really problematic because these, that's the only way to really make sure that they can, they can take the medication and benefit from it. They have to be monitored, you know. Um, and I certainly hope that I, I think there's going to be more and more ways of more real-time monitoring with um, uh, patient-reported outcomes uh, electronically or by phone. I think there's, there are innovative strategies that are not here now. They're, they're not here for us now in the U.S., but I do, I do foresee them coming. I think that from a testing of a, of a ctDNA standpoint, um, my experience has been that um, the way it's working is that, you know, uh, insurance gets billed. There may be some payment. There may not be a lot of payment. And uh, for the most part, patients end up actually paying zero dollars. So I actually um, think, and that's really been my experience, and I, I test very frequently. So um, I think that the uh, patient assistance program soon, now that takes staff in the um, practice, you know, to get the um, the free drug or the copay assistance, et cetera, it takes staffing, so it is more resource intensive. But um, we have a lot of folks as well. You know, not not as many. I don't work in a county hospital, but I have a, a lot of, uh, you know, variety of patients in my practice. And it does take um, extra effort and resources, but it, it certainly is um, feasible. I think mostly it's the coming back and forth and being able to call because folks that have much other other life issues that they're dealing with. It's very difficult for that kind of close monitoring. Thank you, Thank you Joyce. Well, we'll move on to this uh, next um, section, which is continuing on the theme of CDK4-6 inhibition, but now moving into the adjuvant setting. We've seen data for adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibition from Monarch E, which had shown us that in a high-risk ER-positive population, if you added on two years of abemacyclib to endocrine therapy, you saw about a third risk reduction in IDFS events with an absolute difference of uh, almost 8% between the two arms. The majority of the events that were happening were distant events, so it was really reducing uh, distant events. We did not see a significant overall survival, but obviously this would take a really long time to, to reach in, in ER positive setting. Uh, you do see there are numerically fewer events in the abemacyclib arm, and I think importantly you see that there are fewer patients that are living with metastatic breast cancer in the abemacyclib arm, uh, which hopefully will translate eventually into survival advantage. We here saw updated data from Natalie, and so this is the trial looking at adjuvant ribocyclib. The distinction here is that uh, they decided to go with a lower dose of ribocyclob than has been traditionally utilized in the metastatic setting, so here 400 instead of the, the 600 dose that we're used to using. They also utilized three years of therapy in the adjuvant setting as opposed to Monarchy, e, which had two years of abemacyclob. Um, and so I think important to note those differences as well as the patient population. So they really allowed for an expanded population where you could have any nodal involvement and be eligible. You didn't need an additional high-risk feature if you had nodal involvement. Or you could even be node negative as long as your tumor was at least two centimeters and had an additional high-risk feature. So you either had to be high grade or be grade two and have a, a high genomic assay or a high uh, KX67. And so we had previously seen data at ASCO from the second interim analysis. At that time point, 
they had patients who had about 20% of patients had completed all three years of their therapy. So, you know, it was still early on. Now we have about five and a half months more uh, follow-ups or a little around 33 months of follow-up. And so more people have now completed their ribocyclib. So a little over 40% of people have completed three years of ribo. But about 35% of patients did have to discontinue early before completing the three years. So that leaves us with 20% of patients still receiving ribocyclib in the adjuvant setting at the time of this analysis. What you see is that giving the ribocyclib did result in a 25% reduction in IDFS events uh, with about a 3% absolute delta between the two arms. We saw data by subsets, where here you can see data in the stage two patients to the left and the stage three to the right, where the hazard ratios look fairly similar, uh, but you know, obviously absolute differences are different. Uh, in a lower risk population, you're seeing a smaller absolute benefit, a little you know, under 2%, uh, percent, as opposed to the stage three population, where the delta is you know, more around almost 5%. Similarly, you know, we see uh, differences in benefit from node negative to node positive. One thing I would caution you with is in this trial, only 12% of patients actually had positive nodes on pathology. So it is a smaller uh, group of patients in this trial. And you can see the number of events in the node negative patients is quite small. And so you know, the hazard ratio here is 0.72, but you can see the very wide confidence interval surrounding that point estimate. And then to the right, you see the node positive patients with, you know, the hazard ratio of 0.76, um, you know, with again about a 3% difference between the two arms. Most of these events were distant events, which I think is important um, and, and obviously very meaningful. So about, you know, almost 3% um, difference in distant disease-free survival. And, and clearly, overall survival will be very immature. There are 4% events in each arm. With toxicity, um, we do know toxicities are different between ribocyclob and abemocyclob. Abemocyclob certainly more GI toxicity. With ribocyclob, we do see neutropenia, but you can see here the rate of neutropenia is less than what we're traditionally seeing in the metastatic setting given the lower dose. We do see elevated liver enzymes, and a little over 8% of patients had high grade elevation in their LFTs. And you know, there was about 19% of patients that had to discontinue ribocyclob due to adverse events. Um, and QTC prolongation can happen with ribocyclob, though you know the incidence of this is very low, particularly at this uh, lower dose. So you know now we have data from two different um, adjuvant trials, and so let's pretend uh, we had approval for ribocyclob in the adjuvant setting. If you know having both of these agents available, I'm curious uh, what our panel thinks. Are they ready to start prescribing ribocyclob? Um, you know, given the sort of follow-up time here? Do we, is, do we feel like it's ready for prime time? And if we do, in whom would you use it? Um, are you willing to give it, for example, to the sort of intermediate risk group, for example, those even maybe those no negative patients? Um, I'll start with Javier on this one. I really like this data. I, when I saw the last presentation of Monarch E, the curves were crossing a little bit at the very end with a very few number of patients at risk. But now the curves are starting to be very, very beautiful. They continue to, uh, to, to, to separate. So for me, these data are showing that ribocyclib is working nicely in this patient population. However, we have abemacyclib approved in the high-risk patient. And I think that with the data we have with the more follow-up, I think it's difficult, in my opinion, to replace abemacyclib by, 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 by abemacyclib by ribo. On the other side, in the intermediate risk, if I would have the opportunity to use this drug, it is not approved yet, at least in, in Europe, and of course it is not reimbursed, but if it would be, I think that for a selected patient, a group of patients with intermediate risk, this is a drug that certainly I would consider. Oh, thank you. How about you, Heather? Yeah, I think this, I agree. I think this is great data. Um, I think there are a few issues. Number one, we have, you know, longer follow-up from Monarchy, the 7.6% improvement in invasive disease-free survival with the five-year follow-up. Um, here we're looking at 33 months of follow-up for a 36-month, three-year regimen. Um, so I think this is a conversation that sort of needs to be revisited in a year to make sure that those curves after completion of therapy um, stay apart. 
um, and don't collapse. Um, and although I appreciate the consistency of the point estimates on the, on the forest plots for the subsets, there is still a huge confidence interval around the node negative population, so it's not an absolute slam dunk for me. That being said, um, if I had a high risk node negative patient with a high risk uh, oncotype score in my clinic tomorrow and had access to this drug and wanted to give more therapy beyond chemo and hormone therapy, would I consider this? I, I, I probably would, but I don't think that the data yet definitively supports that, and I'm looking forward to further follow-up. Oh, thanks. Joyce, if you want to add anything. Um, yeah, just I really um, agree that for patients who are candidates for abemacyclib per Monarch E, I think the data are very, very strong there, and I will stick with that patient population right now until we have further follow-up, number one. Number two, I do think we need further follow-up on, on um, the uh, Natalie, to be sure that once everybody's off and you know down the road uh, a year off of everything, we want to see those curves, um, you know, pulling apart, not coming back together. Um, but I am there's a there's an unmet need in my in my practice, an unmet need, a, a very high risk node negative patient with a high 70 gene signature or a high you know 21 gene signature, um, you know, grade three, you know, a four centimeter grade three highly proliferative, or even a, a couple nodes positive but doesn't fit the Monarch E um, cohort one. So there are high-risk patients that if it were approved and available to me, I would, I would use it in those patients. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so Bill, uh, from a statistical perspective, do you think we have sufficient data to understand the benefit, particularly in that intermediate risk patients? Like, for example, what about those node negative patients? Uh, and you know, now we've seen a little more follow-up compared to what we saw at ASCO. We have almost six months more follow-up. Does that influence you? We can see the curves are continuing to separate with longer follow-up time. Does that make you feel more confident in the data? Yes, I think I'd like to see the five-year data before we proceed, but I'm not sure. The no negative group is it's a high-risk group, only 12 percent of this data. No matter whether we get to five years or not, we're not going to have a confidence interval that is going to exclude one on that just due to the size of the data set. I'm not sure they should be excluded from consideration. I think um, the trial should be treated as a whole, and the people that are qualified to be in the trial should be eligible for the drug if that's the, the, their direction. So I would not exclude. Um, those that are node negative but still high risk from consideration. Oh, thank you. Um, so Leslie, I'm curious about this from your perspective because you know, let's pretend ribocyclob is approved and, and let's say you know, patient, for example, met monarchy eligibility and, and would have been a candidate for, for either choice. Um, how would you think about this if you were faced with taking three years of ribocyclob compared to two years of abemocyclob? Also, keeping in mind the different side effect profiles, you know, how, how should we be thinking about this from the patient perspective? Um, yeah, thank you. I think, you know, I have never been early stage, so I was diagnosed de novo. So I really had to think about, like, what would I do if in the position of having to make um, this choice after treatment? And interestingly, I had a conversation with another clinician and a patient advocate in the halls, and the clinician's question was, how do I tell, what is the best way to tell my early stage patients the risk of them becoming metastatic? And that's a really hard question, right? Because I don't think any, any early stage patient wants to know the percentage or the risk, and that, but how do you do that to encourage them to go on ribo or abema um, to protect them more from having a recurrence? And so I think you know what I would want from my clinical care team is I would consider this um, knowing even with the high toxicity of you know, Abema especially, 
um, and how that really would affect my quality of life. There's that two years versus three years. Um, you know, I would want them to maybe break it down for me and know that I was being followed um, like my very first one month, two month, get a phone call from a nurse, how are you doing, what are the challenges, keep a diary, you know, how often are you feeling nausea, bone pain, what time, how many times are you having diarrhea, um, how has it changed your quality of life, because if I know that someone is looking out for me and has a genuine interest in me finishing this three, two, three year course treatment, then I will probably stay on it unless, you know, um, six months down the road, I'm really struggling because I can't even go to the grocery store or I can't go to my children's baseball games on the weekends because I have to stay near home and then finally saying, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. But if I knew that somebody had my back for the duration, whether it was three, six months checkup, um, then I would stay in it. I mean, and that might not be everyone's choice, but um, I would know that someone was really, really vested to make sure that I wasn't, or hopefully wasn't going to recur to be metastatic. Oh, thanks, Leslie. Um, you know, I, I think certainly as physicians, we also need to, to make sure we are working closely with our patients to monitor side effects and to do everything we can to, to treat side effects. And I think we've learned a bit about how to do better with this, but obviously can always uh, do more. With abemaciclib, there is an ongoing trial actually trying to evaluate a dose escalation strategy with abemaciclib to see if that will uh, potentially mitigate diarrhea and allow patients to maintain maybe even full dose um, longer and more often. And so that study uh, called TRADE is ongoing. Um, with ribocyclob, obviously, you know, it is a, a bit more of laboratory abnormalities. And with the liver function enzyme probably being one of the trickier things, um, you know, the lower dose, uh, unfortunately, doesn't actually lower uh, rates of LFT toxicity with um, ribocyclob. So that is, is one of the challenges. But again, um, you know, usually you can try to, to dose hold and, and see if it reduces um, with time and then and dose modify. So uh, I'm curious to hear what the audience think about thinks about this after particular in light of this discussion. So you know, again, pretend on Monday you had approval for both ribocyclob and abemaciclib. Um, would you prescribe ribocyclob in the adjuvant setting? And while people are answering, if people want to come to the mics with any additional questions, we're happy to take them from the audience. Looks like most people would prescribe uh, ribocyclob um, with these data. So thank you all. Um, so we'll continue in the early stage setting and uh, talk about immunotherapy. Um, so um, we saw some exciting data, both from Keynote 756 and Checkmate 7FL. Uh, Keynote 756 took patients with stage 2, 3, high-grade ER positive disease and randomized them to get anthracycline taxane chemo with or without uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, patients in the adjuvant setting uh, then continued on pembrolizumab if they were randomized to that preoperatively. We've now seen data with regards to pathologic complete response. And you know I think this was a pretty impressive benefit. We're not used to actually getting high rates of PCR in our ER positive patients. And so here you can see uh, the addition of Pembro did lead to about a 24% PCR rate with a delta of 8.5% between the two arms. One question has arisen, though, is, you know, does pdl one matter? We're in the early triple negative space. We don't test for uh, pdl one status to help us figure out if they need Pembro. We've seen benefit irrespective of pdl one status. But here there does seem to be an interesting trend that you are seeing larger deltas between the two arms as pdl one expression increases. You know, to see a PCR of 40 or 50 percent in a high pdl one positive patient is, is really astounding. Again, we never get that in ER positive disease. Obviously, the control arm is also performing better. We know that uh, pdl one is also prognostic and, and does lead to, to standard chemo performing better, but these deltas are getting uh, larger and larger as pdl one increases. Um, 
We also saw interesting data about ER low patients where you see that PCR rate around almost 60%, which is in line with what we've seen from Keynote 522, suggesting that these ER low patients sort of behave like triple negative breast cancer, and I think you know, should, would be reasonable to give them immunotherapy in the preoperative setting. We also saw data from uh, Checkmate 7FL. In this case, it took, uh, again, patients with stage 2-3, predominantly high-grade ER positive disease, and randomized them to anthracycline, taxane, with or without nivolumab, and then also continued the Nevo out back. This study, however, did decide to close early, and so they will be powered just for PCR and not adequately powered for EFS, even though that will be uh, assessed. And so here you can see very similarly that the PCR uh, significantly increased from 14% to 24.5%. And here again, you're seeing this um, signal that PDL1 is leading to large PDL1 positive tumors are achieving much higher rates of PCR. And so they did a very um, granular analysis of efficacy by PDL1 status, looking at it both SP142 by IC1 cutoff or using 288 CPS scoring. And again, you see this really nice trend as PDL1 increases that you're achieving higher and higher uh, PCR rates and, and larger deltas between the two arms. They also did a very rich biomarker analysis, um, suggesting that having TIL present probably helps being ER high uh, probably doesn't lead to, to larger benefits. Being ER under 50% seemed to, to do better uh, with the nivolumab. And so now, again, we've seen these very robust improvements in PCR in high-grade stage 2, 3 ER positive breast cancer. And so I think the question is, are we ready to really use checkpoint inhibition in this population? We obviously do not have event-free survival data. Uh, do we need it with such a large PCR delta? And do we know if PDL1 is a biomarker given these data? Should, should that be tested? Um, so maybe Javier, I'll start with you. So I think this is a group of patients that might benefit, for example, from abemacyclic in the adjuvant setting. So in the absence of event-free survival data, <clears throat> I think that, or at least I would not use um, immune checkpoint inhibitors in the great majority of the patients. There are paper published in Nature Breast Cancer showing that immunotherapy plus uh, abemacyclic, for example, might induce important toxicity. So in the absence of more data, I wouldn't use it. However, there's a group of patients which are those ones with, uh, with tumors with low ER, I would say one, two, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever, that certainly this, this patient, these tumors behave like triple negative breast cancer. And these data for me are very important because at this time I'm treating these patients with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So these data are very reassuring to say that I have some body of evidence saying that we can do it. So for ER low, I would use it. For the other um, tumors, in my opinion, I think that we have to wait and see the event free survival data before uh, uh, using this strategy broadly. Thank you. Can I ask, uh, Javi, would you give that ER low population a platinum as well per 522, <laughs> or would you give them the 756 I, I would, I would. I, for me, ER low, less than 10%, for me, is triple negative, and I treat these patients exactly the same. I would not use CDK in the first line setting. I try to use the PDL1 to go for immunotherapy in the first line. I go for SG, so I treat these patients as triple negative breast cancer. Heather, I'll toss that question back to you. Would you give the ERLO patient platinum? Uh, and a second question that comes from our audience is, if you use anthracycline-based uh, therapy, are you giving the anthracycline dose dense or Q3 week? So um, I would first disclose that I was involved in both the 756 and the, uh, and the 7FL studies, so I have some biases. <laughs> um, both of those, I think there are a few uh, features of those studies that are worth highlighting. It um, allowed for Q2 weekly or Q3 weekly um, anthracycline administration, which 522 did not allow for. 522 was Q3 weekly administration, and so and we're waiting for some additional data in the triple negative setting to further refine our understanding about whether that's important or not, but it was allowed here. Um, these are studies for... ER positive disease, not hormone receptor positive disease. Um, you had to have estrogen receptor positivity to qualify. Um, and I think it's important to note what you mentioned earlier, but it's worth underscoring 
the 7FL study, when Monarchy was reported, the sponsor made a decision to close the study early and change the primary endpoint to a solitary endpoint of progression free, sorry, of uh, pathologic complete response instead of having the co primary endpoints of pathologic complete response and event free survival. Um, whereas with Keynote 756, it maintained the co-primary endpoints of pathologic complete response and event-free survival. So I don't think that it will be, although as this is very exciting data and, and perhaps exceeded our expectations of pathologic complete response in a population of people who don't typically achieve a pathologic complete response, I think we're waiting for that event-free survival data um, from 756 to really inform our decision making as we did for 522. I do, to, and I didn't answer at all your question there, which I recognize. I do treat the less than 10%. So we saw in 756 that the benefit, the point estimate benefit was very consistent for the ER low, less than 10% as it was for the greater than or equal to 10% um, ER positive. Um, so that consistency across um, subsets has been really reassuring to me. I do treat the less than 10%, um, as Javi does, as triple negative breast cancer, and I do tend to incorporate uh, platinum. And can I throw one more question at you, um, which is, what do you think about the PDL1? One of our audience members says it seems like PDL1 low patients should not be getting immunotherapy in the ER positive setting. Do you agree? I'll come oh, back sorry. to Heather. On that um, I think that PDL1 certainly enriches for a response to therapy, um, but I don't think we have the full picture yet. There was still a, um, you know, just under 5% benefit in that PDL1 negative uh, population, so it does seem that there's a uh, benefit to be had in that PDL1 uh, negative population. Um, so I think it enriches certainly the magnitude of the benefit is greater the more PDL1 there is, but it's not ruled out for that PDL1 negative population. I think it sounds like people are agreeing we need EFS um, to, to before using immunotherapy for ER positive well, patients. Uh, you know, let me let me just say that um, I have not used it yet. This, these data came out at ESMO in October, so I've not used this because um, I was waiting for EFS. I'll tell you, having spoken to a lot of folks here, now we see seven FL and. Um, Seven, five, six, you know, side by side, and see the PDL1 influence. Um, I think that for, until we have EFS, that for the very, very highest risk patients, such as the inflammatory, which were eligible for seven, five, six, inflammatory breast cancer patients with ext you know, extensive disease, of course, grade three. I would actually um, check and make sure that the cancer is PD-L1 positive. I, I would want to see at this, at this point, because we don't have EFS, um, PD-L1 positive by 22C3 of, um, of at least 1%. Um, if it's 10%, I'm even feeling more, because it's a 13.6% delta with the 10% or more, about 9% delta if it's 1% or more. So I, I would actually want to see that at this point. But um, so I, I actually have. Um, changed my thinking a little bit, being here at San Antonio this week, that for the highest risk patients, I would um, consider it at this point, because these um, deltas in PAF-CR are really striking. We, we know, for example, from the iSpy2 um, three-year IDFS publication from Doug Yee, that in the um, HR positive HER2 negative patients, all of whom were 70 gene mammoprint high risk, that if those patients got a path cr they did just like the triple negative breast cancer patients. They, that, in, in that high risk ER positive population, if they got a path cr they did very, very well. So I am kind of comfortable extrapolating from these very large deltas on path cr to um, EFS in the, in the very high risk population. So are you asking the FDA for a companion diagnostic for? <laughs> No, no, I'll just use the one we have. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, Joyce. Well, maybe I've left our local regional colleagues out of the conversation, so actually I'm going to bring you in for, for one question that I, while we're on this topic, and I, I won't ask you about PDL1 as a biomarker, but I will ask, you know, this comes up a lot if someone, you know, is getting adjuvant immunotherapy, 
and they need adjuvant radiation, um, what do you think about whether or not that should be given concurrently or whether or not you should wait till the radiation ends to, to start the adjuvant portion of the immunotherapy? And Rich, I'll, I'll ask you this one. Wow. Uh. <laughs> 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 um, so as far as I don't think there's any documented increased toxicity. Is your mic on? Okay. Sorry. I don't think. Hello. No. Hello. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't think the. Uh, I don't think it's a toxicity issue. The question is, that it, does it will interfere with the efficacy? Of immunotherapy, and I think we're still trying to figure that out. There's been data. There's been some debate whether large fraction sizes inhibit. Um, the immune response versus smaller fractions. We just don't know yeah. at this point. I, I will say I think every institution does this a little differently. At our institution, we've mostly been giving it concurrently, and I, I think a lot of places are. And it certainly was allowed on, on 522 and um, looked reasonable. But again, we don't really know if there's an efficacy advantage or not, uh, which I think is fair. Um, and then we'll finish up our immunotherapy question with this um, really interesting trial uh, in Passion 030, which tried to look at just purely adjuvant immunotherapy. So it took patients with stage 2-3 triple negative disease, randomized them to anthracycline taxane with or without a tezolizumab, and um, you know enrolled a, a population that uh, mostly was half node negative and, and half uh, node positive. And here you see there's really no difference between the two arms. So futility was uh, declared. Um, and uh, therefore was a negative study. Uh, there was also no difference in the pdl one positive subgroup. You know, Bill, I'll ask you, can you help us understand, you know, how one declares futility with these types of statistical analyses? Well, uh, typically it would have been in, in the protocol from the very beginning. I see there was uh, a request from the review board to actually do a futility analysis and did do an interim analysis for efficacy at an earlier time point. I'm not sure what the board knew at the time that they made that request, as whether they had seen a Kaplan-Meier and wanted the trial to, to stop enrollment with only 100 patients left in this trial. They stopped enrollment. Um, and clearly, it was a futile study. It was has a ratio greater than one, which is a very typical assessment for futility at an interim analysis. So they did the right thing and didn't enroll the next 100 patients, as far as I'm concerned. And so now seeing this, first I'm curious why there's no benefit here to the adjuvant atezolizumab. Obviously, we see robust benefits in the preoperative when immunotherapy with pembrolizumab is started preoperatively. Um, so why do you think we're not seeing benefit here? Is it atezolizumab versus pembrolizumab? Is it because this is adjuvant, not neoadjuvant? Um, so, and then I think I'll also ask you a second question. You know, sometimes we mistakenly take patients to surgery that really should have gotten preoperative therapy. Maybe they have, we think they have a small tumor by imaging. We think it's stage one, and we take them to upfront surgery, and it turns out they've got you know several nodes involved and, and have higher stage disease. What do you do if you meet that patient in clinic now? What regimen would you actually give a stage two, three patient who did go to upfront surgery? Um, Javier, I'll, I'll start with you. No, for me, there is, not a, no, there is not issue here. I wouldn't use any checkpoint inhibitor in the adjuvant setting only. I think this is because the tumor up in, in place might play a role in the absence of more data after new adjuvant. I would definitely not use immunotherapy here. Would anyone give a, a stage 2-3 patient um, adjuvant immunotherapy with pembrolizumab, which is what we have approved? The only t time I would do it, of course, we all want to treat these patients preoperatively, but if um, at an outside institution uh, she had surgery, um, the only time I would consider it is if I had a PET CT scan that showed considerable nodal disease, and so she was still had a fair amount of tumor, or she's still, margins were not obtained, and she's going to need more surgery, so I still think she's got tumor, um, then, then I would, but if she um, was basically NED, I would not. Yeah. Heather, would you do anything differently? Yeah, so again, full disclosure, um, I was a co-PI on the Impassion 030 Alexandra study, so I have maybe some inherent biases there as well, but um, a few things. Um, 
you know, it was supposed to be capped at 50% node negative, and because of the early stop, it actually was more than 50% node negative in the end. Um, whether that's an issue, I don't know. Um, I do suspect, however, based on this data and the fact that the SWOG 1418 study hasn't reported out, which again is the um, study looking at patients who have residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy who were randomized to no further therapy versus a year of pembrolizumab hasn't yet reported out. That's an event-driven study that um, closed to accrual now several years ago um, and hasn't reported. So I suspect that probably the magnitude of the benefit is conferred with the co-administration with chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. So finally, our local regional colleagues get to uh, weigh in, and we will need your help here. <laughs> <laughs> Desperately. Um, so we saw uh, this uh, data from the Cinemac trial. So this was a, a randomized study uh, for patients who had a positive sentinel node to get completion axillary dissection or not. Uh, the median tumor size in this trial was about uh, 20 millimeters, but there was a small cohort of patients, about 6%, that were T3. Uh, most of the patients here were ER positive, HER2 negative, so almost 90% of patients. And the majority of patients had one sentinel node with a ma macromet. Uh, about a third of patients did have extranodal extension. When you look uh, at the patients who went on to axillary dissection, if they had had one sentinel node that was positive, about a third ended up having additional nodes found. If there were two sentinel nodes positive, about half end up having nodes at time of dissection. Uh, but when we compare doing axillary dissection to not in these node positive patients, we do not see any difference in recurrence free survival. And so uh, maybe Alistair, I'll ask you, you know, what additional information is this providing us outside of what we've seen already from Z11 and Amaros? And then what do you think about who should actually get an axillary dissection after a positive sentinel node? Well, thank you very much for inviting me along. This is a great session. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> so to answer your question, or questions, I think this is confirmation that we need to do less and less surgery in certain selected session uh, se uh, conditions. And this should add to our practice of being more selective when we go into the axilla and complementing the Amaros trial, which was demonstrating that um, radiation is just as effective as more extensive surgery. I'm afraid I have to start believing that Rich and his radiation oncology colleagues have actually got the answers here rather than more extensive surgery. You are educable. <laughs> no, I think this is a great study. In fact, um, uh, I was telling a colleague that this particular San Antonio was actually a pretty consequential San Antonio with regards to local regional therapy because of this and other studies. So this was a fantastic meeting for us. I agree, it really confirms uh, Z11 and Amrose. Important thing to remember is that 90 plus percent of these patients had radiation, close to 90%, and close to 90% were ERPR positive or two negative. So it clearly serves that group. Outside of that group, it's a little bit more of a question. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of other nuances here. One is that lobular cancer patients were also included, and I think that's an important mm -hmm. consideration. And we're probably going to get the definitive answer to this question from the POSNOC study, Australia, New Zealand, UK, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of patient reported outcomes. We can't forget that a lot of what we do surgically and from a radiation point of view Absolutely. does impact the long-term um, survivorship issues. So who should actually get a dissection if they have a positive node? I think it's now vanishingly few patients, perhaps those who we suspect as a higher disease burden, but in that case, radiation may be at least as good a solution as further surgery. So I have a, a, a question <clears throat> for you both. So you have a patient with T1 and two leave nodes, and is lobular. How many of these patients do have a lot of leave nodes in the axilla afterwards? Would you feel comfortable without axilla leave node dissection in low lower carcinoma if you have at least two nodes in the axilla? So we'll hear from Rich in a moment, but I think this is a multidisciplinary right. discussion with the patient and her views central so that we can work out what the morbidities of further, research, further surgery might be versus 
the amazing impacts that both radiation and your modern drugs, some of which we've been hearing about, can have on the patient. Yeah, and, and my final comment, because I think it's, it's from, from the practical point of view, could be important. Okay, so if this is grade one or grade two, and key IC7 in the range of 15 or 20, this might have consequences, for example, for abemacycline. Maybe now with Rivo, this is not so important. But in the meantime, for abema, it's critical. If you have four nodes or more, you will be able to use it. If not, we will not. So don't you think that this might change the way we treat systemically this patient? So you're taking me down that dangerous <laughs> path <laughs> of tempting me to say we need to do an axillary lymph node dissection. Very rarely that may be the answer, but frequently it will be a team decision, yeah, patient-centric as to what we should do. Oh, thank you. So we also saw some data about um, residual isolated tumor cells that are found after someone has had neoadjuvant therapy. So this has been a question about what to do if ITCs are seen uh, at time of nodal evaluation after preoperative therapy. We do know that uh, in general having a, node, a sentinel node being positive can lead to you know, having a positive nodes found at time of axillary dissection. And so the question is, is, is that also true if it's just ITCs? And so this was a very nice multi-center uh, cohort study that looked at patients who did have ITCs found on sentinel node after pre-op adjuvant, uh, sorry, after preoperative therapy. And you can see there are 182 patients that subsequently subsequently had an axillary dissection and 400 patients that did not have a dissection and they have about three years of follow-up. So for those patients that went on to have dissection, there were 30% of patients who did have positive nodes, but only 5% of those nodes were macromets. Uh, most of them were ITCs or micromets. But when you look at differences in outcomes, whether or not someone had an axillary node dissection or not, you really see there isn't a significant difference between the two arms. And so, you know, now I'll turn it back to uh, Rich and Alistair. Is what do you think of these data? Do you think this means that if someone who has ITCs at time of sentinel node after pre-op therapy should not have an axillary dissection? Is this definitive? Do we need any additional data to, to really say that? First, I want to say this is a monumental effort by the group to collect all those very rare cases, and I applaud them for doing that. Um, I also want to say, though, I'm not quite sure we can be really, truly de definitive at this point for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, there's a 3.2-year median follow-up. So I don't think that's anywhere near long enough for us to make a, a decision. What they show is a five-year estimated difference, but really there's only a 3.2-year median follow-up. But there's some other things that just kind of bother me just a bit. Um, if you look at the group that did not have an axillary node dissection, they were slightly lower risk than those that had an axillary node dissection. They were less likely, statistically significantly, less likely to have lymphovascular invasion. They were also statistically significantly more likely to be clinically node negative. negative. And then there's this really weird finding that when you compare the axillary node dissection group, 68% of them were identified on frozen versus only 8% in the non-axillary node dissection group were defined, defined, um, identified on frozen. So that really suggests that the, the no axillary node dissection group was a lower risk. However, when you look at those curves, the no axillary node dissection group is a slightly higher recurrence rate. Granted, it's not statistically significant, but it just doesn't quite make clinical sense to me. So for those reasons, I really would like to wait a little bit longer. How about you, Alistair? Thank, thanks, Rich. I, I find it dis difficult to disagree with you, unfortunately. <laughs> but there are a couple of nuances. The first is maybe we should ask our busy pathologist to stop looking for ITCs quite as hard as they're having to do. <laughs> Secondly, we have to bear in mind that uh, an auxiliary lymph node dissection, however that is done, is not a bundle of fun for the patients Absolutely. in this setting. Thirdly, we have to recognize that these patients will probably get definitive radiation treatment to this area, and perhaps your radiation rather than my surgery mm -hmm. is preferable in terms of reducing morbidity. So while this may not be the perfect randomized trial, 
it is giving us real world pragmatic evidence from a massive effort, as you said, and it may be what people use in the clinic on Monday to make their decisions. <coughs> Well, thank you, guys. And, you know, I think as you brought up, you know, this generally also comes into multidisciplinary decisions as well, um, certainly between the surgeon and radiation oncologist, but also sometimes, as Javier brought up, sometimes us medical oncologists uh, try to see if we can get some more additional information, too. And so, uh, obviously, that, that becomes a, an important conversation. We did see this data also from NSABP B51, uh, which was a trial for patients who started off with a positive axillary node before preoperative chemotherapy, and then at the time of surgery, uh, converted to being lymph node negative. And so it randomized patients to get regional nodal irradiation or not. And what we found was that there was no improvement in outcomes if patients had regional nodal irradiation compared to those who did, uh, and this was pretty consistent across subgroups, but I'll uh, see what our, our colleagues think about that. Um, also, when you looked at distant recurrence-free interval, again, no real difference. Uh, and same with uh, disease-free survival, and uh, obviously follow-up time is, is short, but no difference in, in overall survival. So, uh, Rich, is there a role for regional nodal irradiation in any patient who presents with a positive node up front and then uh, converts to being node negative at the time of surgery? So again, this is a, a great, great study, and I'm, I'm so happy I was here to, to see it presented. Um, this really makes a strong argument against uh, regional nodal irradiation, those who convert to node negative. Um, uh, as was pointed out uh, during the presentation, um, the EBCTC group recently published on the benefit of regional nodal irradiation. and. Um, as to, to quote the, the person who asked the question, radiation is a long-term investment. And that they, at 15 years out, they were able to show a small but statistically significant survival benefit in that group. So it'd be interesting to see how things move forward. There, are, there is a fair bit of uh, retrospective data that lines up with this as well. So I think this is real. The, the, let me get a little geeky on you. There's little small points of this that really um, I, I don't understand, and Dr. Muniz did not really um, go into them on detail. If you look at an unplanned subset analysis, um, the groups that were ERPR positive, HRU2 negative, were well over on the other side of the forest part, plot in favor of regional nodal radiation, whereas those who were triple negative were well over on the other side of the forest plot, for, for, um, forest plot um, not needing, not benefiting from regional nodal radiation. That's really interesting finding. Um, however, it does line up with some other findings we've seen in other studies, whereas those patients who were ERPR positive, HER2 negative, were the ones who benefited the most um, from adjuvant radiation. So it'd be really interesting to see how those authors explain that finding. Can, can I just ask a question? What if you have a patient with a, um, a cancer, a big, a big cancer, uh, stage three that was in the upper upper inner quadrant, but you know she was positive in her axilla. You know, per mm -hmm. this study, she biopsy positive in the axilla. You get a pet, and there's you know quite a bit of you know some of these patients have a lot of nodes mm -hmm. initially, and then she gets preoperative, and she's a PAF CR, um, whether she's ER positive or, or triple negative. Is there is there any role in a such the highest risk patient? You know, the axilla is looked at, and it's, it's clear, but she had a lot of other nodes that haven't been sampled, and maybe the bulk of the disease was more medial. Yeah. So that's, that's the art of medicine, right? I mean, she probably would not have qualified for this study, and therefore, I don't think you can use those results. But may I ask you a question, or my medical oncology colleagues a question? Um, so we typically are reluctant to offer, a little reluctant to offer ERPR positive, HER2 negative patients neoadjuvant chemotherapy, because there's not as great a response rate. Now with the results of this study, there's, there's an additional benefit, right? We, we were able to prevent axillary node dissection, but now we have proof that those that have a response may be able to avoid radiation. Will that lower your threshold for offering neoadjuvant chemo in this population? Not for you, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> It's rare, to, it's rare to see medical oncologists silent. I know. Someone take a picture of this. I love it. 
think that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So I don't know if this will lower the bar to go for chemotherapy, but that's another argument to do so. So why not? If this grade three, we are starting to do it. If it is high ki ist 7 as well. But now, if you have one node or whatever, and you know that if you achieve a good uh, pathological permission in the nodes, you can avoid radiation therapy. So good an argument. But you said before, Alistair, that it's an MTD discussion. This is as well. Do you think, Javier, are you ever getting a genomic assay on the core in an ER positive patient to help decide who needs pre-op chemo? Because I think here you'd want to know that that patient's really going to respond to preoperative chemotherapy. And I will say, in someone you know who has locally advanced disease, I am getting genomic assays up front. Uh, are any of you doing that to help you figure out who needs pre-op chemo? Yeah. 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 In general, yeah. 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 So you think that this really uh, just applies to those because it's T1. Uh, sorry, N, N1. It was T1 to 3, N1. So, um, Alistair and Rich, you don't think this really applies to a, to a patient who had like an N2 disease or anything, clinically N2? Okay, thanks. So there was this interesting study uh, that looked at screening in patients who have a history of uh, a breast cancer. And so this took patients who were three years post their uh, surgery for their breast cancer um, and tried to space out screening mammography. So it had a control arm of doing our standard yearly mammography versus in someone who had a lumpectomy going to every two years or someone had a mastectomy for the, um, well, then they get every three years on the other side. So. Um, here, this was only for postmenopausal women who were over the age of 50. Um, you, the trial mostly enrolled patients who had a history of ear positive disease. Most of them were node negative. Uh, here, the follow-up time is about six years out from the time of people going on study. So remember, they went on study three years out from their diagnosis. So that means they were, you know, over eight years of follow-up from the time of diagnosis. They're not seeing a difference in breast cancer-specific survival, uh, recurrence-free interval, uh, or overall survival. Um, and so, Alistair, I, I know this is something you've been thinking about. Uh, what do you think about the idea of spacing out mammograms uh, in patients? Well, thank you for highlighting this study. It dates from before I acquired my East Texas accent, <laughs> and we started it off in the UK. And part of the reason behind this is the anxiety that some folks feel when they're having annual mammography long term. So there is clearly a group of women, the over 50s, who've got to that three-year mark where maybe not having to do annual mammography will be just as good as doing annual mammography. And, and so... I need to talk to my imaging colleagues when I get back to, to Baylor in Houston on Monday morning and beg the question, when this study is published, and it's not yet published and peer-reviewed, should we change our practice? Because I would believe on the evidence we've seen in this presentation, we probably should. Do you think that follow-up time is long enough, though? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you think the follow-up time of you know eight to nine years is a long enough time frame? So bear in mind, this is the women who've got to the three-year mark without any difficulties. There are some triple negative HER2 positive patients. They're most at ER positive, though. So many of these women would probably have had their events by now. We can't be certain that we won't miss events in the future. But I think on balance, probably yes, it's sufficient duration of follow-up. But you make a great point. Leslie, how, how do you feel about this? Obviously, there's a lot of distress that comes about with screening mammography, but on the flip side, there can also be distress about not getting screened. And so, you know, how would you feel about this as a patient if presented with the opportunity to space out your, your screening mammography? Um, I, well, I can only speak from a metastatic perspective um, that, you know, in the cancer world, um, everything for us, less is more, unless it's our neutrophil counts, right? So, um, yeah, I would want to have less mammographies, mammograms um, in the follow-up setting. I mean, it, it certainly did seem like there was a lot of distress, but, you know, I, I think, I guess I, I, I would say I'd be a little cautious here, too, yeah. because it is ER positive disease, and they can't have late events, and I think we just, you know, most of them aren't local, but um, it does make you, you know, worry a little bit, and so we'll have to see the final published data. 
Um, so switching gears uh, to HER2 positive disease, we saw updated data from Catherine today. This was a study of preoperative uh, therapy for patients who had HER2 positive, HER2 directed therapy and had residual disease. And then question. in the oh yes, please. So Alistair, I have a question for you. In the light of the Sentinel node data that was presented, what is the role of frozen section post new adjuvant therapy or of any nodal examination by frozen section. I couldn't quite catch that. Could you just reframe the question, please? The role of frozen section, intraoperative okay. frozen section analysis of lymph nodes. So should intraoperative frozen, if intraoperative frozen section be available, I guess I think that's a conversation between the pathologist and the surgeon ahead of time. But I suspect that what we're going to do is move increasingly to using the increasingly good preoperative assessment, not doing intraoperative assessment with all the problems that can create for the team and for proper management of the axilla, and then on rare occasions having to revisit the axilla at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. So for uh, we'll, we'll circle back to Catherine. Um, so this looked at, for patients with residual disease after HER2-directed therapy, uh, 14 cycles of TDM1 versus continuation of trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting. We've obviously seen data from this study before with three years of follow-up and saw very dramatic benefits with TDM1 in the residual disease population with a hazard ratio of about 0.5. Um, you know, so clear benefit, and this has become our standard of care, uh, but overall survival data at that time was uh, immature. Now we have over eight years of follow-up, and this is the final IDFS analysis where you consistently see this benefit, hazard ratio 0.54, and now almost a 14-month delta between the two arms. Um, when you look at site of first IDFS event, we do see generally a reduction of, of uh, sites of recurrence across the board with the exception of CNS events where unfortunately we are not seeing that TDM1 is reducing CNS as first site of recurrence. When looking at overall survival, and I think this was the exciting thing from this morning's presentation, uh, is that there was a statistically significant benefit at, in overall survival at this time point with about a 5% delta between the two arms uh, and a hazard ratio of 0.66. You can see this benefit is seen uh, generally in most subgroups, although I'm curious to hear what the panel thinks about those patients who have a teeny tiny amount of residual disease uh, where, you know, that, that looks like it's around one. So, you know, I'll turn to my medical oncology colleagues here. Does seeing a survival benefit change anything in your practice? And is there any patient with residual HER2 positive disease for whom you don't use TDM1? Is there any exception, Javier? No, no, definitely not. But I would like to make, or to call attention here. So unfortunately, many people are starting to argue against invasive disease free survival or progression free survival in metastatic disease for drugs approvals. And I think this is a big, big mistake. If this drug would not have been approved many years ago, thousands of patients would have died as a consequence of this stupid decision. So we do not have to wait to see survival when we decrease metastasis. We are cured many, many patients thanks to the medical oncologists that have started to use this drug before waiting to see the overall survival data. So congratulations to the authors, but this should not have changed anything. Thank you, Javier. Yeah. I don't know, can anyone have any comments after that? <laughs> no, I was, I, was um, I, I actually was getting ready to stand up and do a standing ovation. I wasn't gonna be the first one. I was a little emotional seeing 13 and a half percent. That is unbelievable. And then the survival as well. I thought it was like a really, really big moment in our history, basically. But I think it also underscores, I mean, these are great results, obviously, and underscore our existing um, practice already. So it just supports what we're already doing. But, you know, over 80% improvement in invasive disease-free survival at seven years, that's still 20% of patients who have a recurrence in this high-risk population, and so there's more work to be done, and in my mind just underscores the importance of the COMPASS residual disease effort, which is looking at adding to catnib to TDM1, for example, and other efforts in this space to try and um, even further improve these numbers. <laughs>
Yeah, also the you know, Destiny Presto 5 study looking at TDXD yes, yes, yes. and so lots, lots of ongoing work to continue to improve our outcomes. And I think what I find exciting is also just that we finally learned that we can try to tailor therapy to the individual patient by understanding that if they have residual disease, you know, we can use different therapy and really change their outcome and, and even have a survival advantage, which is, is huge. Um, so sticking in the HER2 positive theme, we saw data in the metastatic setting looking at TDM1 with or without tecatinib. This was a trial for patients who had metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer that had previously progressed on uh, prior taxane and trastuzumab. Uh, they were allowed to have stable treated brain mets or active brain mets or, or not have brain mets at all and got randomized one-to-one -to, -one to TDM1 with or without tecatinib. You can see here that... Um, about almost half the patients had brain metastases, so about 20% of those were active brain mets and about 20% were stable treated brain mets. And when you look at the line of therapy that people were treated in, uh, two-thirds of patients, in essence, had had one line of systemic therapy in the metastatic setting, and about 16% had had two lines, very few in the, the first-line setting. And so here you see the data with progression-free survival, and it was statistically significant, an improvement from 7.4 to 9.5 months. And so the hazard ratio was 0.76. We also saw data for the patients who had brain metastases. This was not divided into active or stable treated brain mets, but overall for patients with brain mets. And you see, again, this improvement in PFS now from 5.7 to 7.8 months, hazard ratio of 0.64. Overall survival data is still immature, um, so uh, not able to assess that at this time. With the combination of TDM1 and tecatinib, we did see that there were elevation in liver function enzymes, so about 29% of patients did have a grade 3 or higher um, hepatic adverse events, and so that did result in patients needing to dose hold um, in about a third of patients on the um, tecatinib um, arm. Uh, and dose reduce uh, in about 20% of patients, though only um, you know, a small number of patients, around 7%, discontinued, for example, the tecatinib. Um, we obviously have already seen data with a different backbone with tecatinib from HER2-CLIMB that looked at capecitabine trastuzumab with or without tecatinib and already have seen an improvement in both progression-free and overall survival and have seen data specifically from this trial, even for patients who have active uh, brain metastases. Um, so, you know, this is the active brain mets population with a delta of almost 10 months in survival between the two arms. And the toxicity profiles are a little different with the capecitabine backbone compared to TDM1, where obviously with capecitabine, you're seeing more in the way of diarrhea and hand foot syndrome. Still some elevation in LFT is just not quite as high with the combination of TDM1 and tecatinib. And so I think this leaves us with a bit of a conundrum because you know, let's say we had approval for TDM1 and tecatinib and had approval for capecitabine at to catnib with trastuzumab, how would we then think about this and where do we place this on our algorithm? Or would anyone substitute uh, capecitabine to catnib trastuzumab with TDM1 to catnib? Um, how, how and where would they use this? Um, so, um, Javier, I'll start with you. I, well, for me, this study is very important because this is something that maybe might change something in the adjuvant setting, optimizing the patient with brain metastasis with TDM1. But in the metastatic disease, I like the data, to be honest, but I don't think this will change the way we treat our patients. I think that TDSD is there. Clearly, TDSD, in my opinion, is superior to TDM1 plus to catinib. I know that they have not been compared, but that's what I think. And again, the sequence here is important. I think that we have great data, as you presented, Sarah, with trust to CAPE and to CATINIP. So I would prefer to sequence these two strategies, TN1 and TUCA, or TUCA and TN1, more than combined. I, I, I think this, I don't think that this will have a great, great use in the clinical practice. That, that's my opinion, but I can understand other, other comments here. How about Joyce? Um, I, I, I really agree with um, that. I think with the survival advantage in the overall population as well as in the brain met populations in HER2 climb, that, that the data are stronger for benefit for patients with the uh, TTC triplet uh, because we don't have survival in HER2 climb O2. 
Um, and, you know, the PFS is positive overall, but it's not that impressively positive. Now, if somebody has GI issues and they can't take capecitabine or something, we do have a nice signal for brain metastasis in the HER2 climo 2 So there's probably the occasional patient for whom this would be better. But I think I will be sticking with the uh, TTC regimen um, uh, for, for patients, you know, after, after second-line TDXD or even second-line if patients have really dominant brain metastasis. It's my go-to regimen. I'd just like to point out that Joyce... Um, has established a new acronym, TTC, for the tegadnib trastuzumab cape cytobine regimen. Um, um, for me, the HER2-CLIM-02 um, fundamentally underscored for me that we are already using tegadnib in the right way. It's obviously such an important medication um, that's been practice changing, and the HER2-CLIM regimen um, with these updated survival analyses in the brain meds population especially um, is um, such an important um, regimen in our armamentarium, but um, I don't think that there's really a real role for the TDM1 to catna regimen, but I think this data does support some um, idea of, of efficacy with the combination that's um, I think will be exciting to see in the curative intent setting in the ongoing clinical trial. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, so one thing I think that sometimes come up, comes up is how do we sequence in radiation for someone who has brain metastases? When would we prefer, for example, to try a systemic therapy that's active in the CNS versus maybe doing something local? Um, you know, Rich, when your medical oncology colleagues come to you with a patient who may have CNS involvement, how do you guys make this decision together? Sure. I, so... Um, Again, we would do this in a multidisciplinary fashion, and it really depends on the situation. You imagine you have a patient who has no systemic disease and only CNS disease and a small amount of it. Then, you know, stereotactic radiosurgery works really well and has, has minimal toxicity. But if you have someone who's got a heavy systemic burden of disease, as well as brain metastasis, certainly systemic therapy would be a better option at that point. Yeah, and it's nice to see that, you know, for example, the HER2 climb regimen and, and even HER2 climb O2 have such a nice benefit uh, in terms of systemic therapy response. And so, you know, having an active regimen potentially could help them delay at least uh, radiation, which, which is nice in some cases. Um, so, Leslie, you know, if you if we had approval for TDM1 tecatinib or the capecitabine uh, tecatinib trastuzumab regimen and, you know, your physician offered you either regimen. How would you think about interpreting the differences between these regimens? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it. I, I can't reiterate again that, you know, it is so important to know your patient, what their goals are in their life at the time of... Um, offering these options. You know, I am on Kip Cape Cytobine, and it has been the most gentle drug to me as far as um, side effect profiles so far, and this is my fourth line of treatment. But then I also hear from other patients that, you know, capcitabine is horrible for them, hand foot syndrome, mouth sores, and all of that. Um, I know patients on um, Catsyla that are doing really well, well others aren't, and so I really think that it depends on your patient and, you know, being able to be transparent and share with them the data of what the research shows for um, adverse side effects and really taking into consideration what your patient is doing. Are they still working full time? Um, how old are their kids at home? Um, and really just you know, hearing where they are in their life and what is important to them. So as far as the differences in the backbones, I think that both um, are reasonable and um, I think that they are good choices. Oh, thanks, Leslie. And, and certainly it's nice to have choice and, and be able to personalize that, that decision. Um, so again, always nice to, to have more, more potential options. 
Um, and then what about uh, data we've now seen from Dato DXD uh, for patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive disease? We saw some updated analyses here at San Antonio from Tropion Best 01. This was a trial for patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer that had received one to two prior lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting and got randomized to get Dato DXD compared to physician's choice chemotherapy. Uh, with Dato DXD being a trope 2 directed ADC with a topoisomerase 1 payload. We saw that there was a significant benefit in terms of progression free survival for Dato relative to treatment of physician's choice chemo, improving PFS from 4.5 to 6.9 months with a hazard ratio of 0.64. Um, we also saw a delayed time to subsequent therapy. And when they looked at different subgroups in terms of benefit, whether or not they had prior CDK for less than 12 months or greater than 12 months, it didn't seem to matter. Similar benefits, whether or not they had a history of brain mets or not, it didn't seem to matter in terms of relative benefit from therapy. And when they looked at uh, adverse events, you can see that numerically there are fewer adverse, high-grade adverse events, for example, in the DATO arm as well as all-grade uh, AEs. Um, and when you specifically look um, at need for um, dose reduction, uh, it's not that different. Uh, dose, dose discontinuation rates are very low in each arm at just 3%. Um, it was nice to see also a, a delay uh, in deterioration to global health status with data relative to chemo. So let's pretend uh, the FDA decides to approve data DXD based on this PFS benefit. OS is still immature. We now have a lot of ADCs to choose from. Um, so we have a TDXD approved in the one to two prior lines of chemotherapy space for hormone receptor positive disease, as well as for triple negative disease. Um, th that's her too low. Uh, we also have sasituzumab approved in the metastatic setting in, in both subtypes. In this case, in Tropic So2 in hormone receptor positive disease, it was technically studied in two to four prior lines of chemotherapy, though our guidelines do suggest utilization second line. And so if Dato DXD comes on the block, uh, what are you all going to do uh, in terms of sequencing uh, therapy for your patients? So Joyce, I'll start with you. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think with um, sasituzumab having survival in both triple negative and um, HR positive breast cancer, we're talking about HR positive here, um, I would probably, for the HER2-0, and we'll see what um, Destiny Breast 06 shows in the HER2 ultra low, which is essentially zero, um, we'll have to see what those data show. That'll be another, you know, wrinkle to integrate. But for, um, for right now, I would um, hold off on the um, uh, DATO until I had survival uh, data because the Tropic O2 data has survival, 3.2 month improvement in survival um, in uh, HR positive HER2, negative HER2 zero patients. For HER2 low patients, um, I certainly would prioritize the um, TDXD. Um, then I would um, consider uh, sequencing. And if someone um, got sasituzumab and then DBO. Uh, six is positive, and we can use the TDXD in patients who are ultra low or zero. Then I would I would sequence over there as well. I'm getting more comfortable with the idea of sequencing um, just from some some you know anecdotal patients I've seen and talking to other doctors who are getting more comfortable with it uh, as well. We need more data on that uh, as well. But that's kind of where I stand right now. How about you, Heather? Would <laughs> yeah. with the three ADCs, would you ever sequence all three? How what order would you give them? In? I agree with Joyce that for the HER2 low, I would favor trastuzumab durex tecan. For the HER2 zero, I would probably, I, I, I would equivocate and have a conversation with the patient, um, probably around toxicity management. So sasituzumab govotecan doesn't have the interstitial lung disease risk, but does require neutropenia management for most patients. Dato DXD does have um, a lower ILD risk, it seems, than trastuzumab directs you can, but it's non-zero. Um, and the stomatitis, the mouth issues are real and requires um, daily um, dexamethasone uh, mouth mouthwash uh, throughout the duration of treatment for most patients. So I, I think it depends on where the patient's at in terms of their journey and what toxicity they're willing to consider.
But you, so you'd pick one, either data or SASE, mm -hmm. but would you ever give them sequentially? I mean, we have zero sequential <laughs> um, sequencing data for these drugs, for um, trastuzumab DRX secan with either of these drugs. I mean, we really have no data. But a lot of people are trying to generate data, not with these two drugs specifically that I'm aware of, um, but with ADCs in general. Um, the TBCRC is, um, is undertaking a couple studies in that space. But with data DXD and sazituzumab, in the absence of any data, here. I will say the only thing I will bring up is this is not the same setting, but in the metastatic triple negative setting, when they had done their phase one study of DATO DXD in pretreated metastatic triple negative patients, patients were allowed to have had prior sasituzumab, and they did show that there were some patients who did respond. In fact, I remember a patient of mine who had a near CR after progressing on sasituzumab, so it made me wonder. And I think it just goes to show we really have no idea of why people are developing resistance to ADCs and how to predict when someone's going to benefit to the next one. But it's you know, very weird, right, if you have two trope one, trope two targeting uh, ADCs with topo one payloads that there's possibility and, and maybe a small subset that, that it could work. And I think we just really need to understand this better. And hopefully for on ctDNA, we'll get more information about the topoisomerase one mutations that predict for SN38 no longer binding to that site because um, Druxican binds to a different site. And so I'd be comfortable, but we need more data on that about what, which mutations predict that the um, sasituzumab stopped working because of a mutation in the, in the, in the uh, target enzyme, the topoisomerase. There's a lovely paper from uh, the MGH Cancer Discovery. Um, Aditya Bardi and other colleagues are on there. What about? A couple, three years ago, very nice paper, looking at three patients and kind of doing a deep dive molecularly as to why the patients became resistant to sasituzumab. So it's, you can kind of get a view for the future. It's not here with us now, but I hope we'll have data to help us um, just in ctDNA understand where what mutations are being acquired. Um, and uh, you know, for example, there was another mutation in trope two itself um, for the sasituzumab. And the mutation in trope 2 changed the conformation such that it would not um, stay in the plasma membrane. It was in the cytoplasma, collected in the cytoplasm. So again, you know, if there are certain mutations that are changing trope 2 that's such that it will not have a target in the plasma membrane, that would be great to know, because then you wouldn't sequence them necessarily, because there'd be no trope 2 there. I mean, obviously more work to be done, but um, the sequencing studies that are going on, I think, will help, help um, elucidate that. Oh, thank you. So we still have a lot to learn, but uh, it's been a great San Antonio. And thank you all for staying uh, late on a Friday evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all our excellent panelists uh, as well for the wonderful discussion. So have a great night, everyone. You too.